morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Christelle Rin, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at HR Locker. So today I am uh, delighted to have Philip Brophy with us from Pushmi. So thank you, Philip, for taking the time today to have a chat with me. Um, so we're going to really go through about, I suppose, the changing dynamic in the work landscape, the work landscape to focus not only on remote and hybrid, but also on just the way that work has changed, the environment that people work in, expectations of employees, um, and how us as HR managers and CEOs and leaders can, can facilitate that and help our employees um, grow with the company and also really focusing on that talent retention side of things as well. As always, I have um, Jenny with me, who's in the questions and answers section. So if at any time you have any questions for Philip or you want to stop me talking, please feel free to put um, a question into the questions and answers section and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. I really do encourage anybody who has a question to to put it in there and um, and, and we can we can have a chat about it throughout um, throughout the webinar. So Philip, uh, lovely to have you with us today. I suppose if you want to just start with maybe giving us a brief outline of uh, your own company pushed me and your own background and um, I suppose your your expertise to date. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for having me on, Christelle. Delighted to be here. Yeah, so Push Me um, is a digital coaching provider. So we opened our doors in 2021 with the mission to change the way companies develop and retain their best people. So our product is built on a, a very simple uh, principle. So an employee becomes disengaged and leaves their and leaves their company because they have a problem they can't solve. That might be with the unmanageable workload, a difficult colleague, um, or you know a lack of career progression. So everything we do as a company as designer and helping that individual feel more engaged and feel more connected at work and the way we do that is by helping them solve those problems that they own within their role uh, and we achieve this using a, a digital coaching platform that's very much grounded in the latest behavioral and performance science great um so philip there's been so much you know in the last few years in regards to changing work landscape obviously we talk a lot about remote working um but that's really not the only thing there's also been a massive shift in income in, in employees i think who are really focused on working in a job that um that they see value in and there is this kind of um employees who aren't happy with their job are really tending to shift to another job it does seem to be a very employee driven marketplace at the moment um from a hr manager perspective or from a ceo perspective i suppose what do you think are the most effective ways that we can kind of nurture and retain that ta that talent during times of change that you're not seeing this mass exodus of people? Yeah, so when, uh, I think the first thing uh, um, that people need to do, whether you're an HR manager, chief people officer, CEO, um, is look at the problem. So what what is the problem? So I've included a few stats here uh, around why people are leaving. So the Work Institute, they're a, a company in the US, they carry out thousands and thousands of exit interviews. They try to figure out why people are leaving. And the main reason people are leaving is due to job and career reasons. So that's obviously based in the States primarily. But look at closer to home, we know from the Microsoft Work Index report, they, they uh, detailed um, you know, the three top reasons. So a lack of confidence and leadership, uh, well-being and, and not getting that desired promotion. So we say take um, each of those individually, like a lack of confidence and leadership. You know, we, we know the saying that people leave um, uh, managers, not companies. So I think there needs to be a huge emphasis uh, placed on supporting managers because they're feeling overworked, they're feeling overstressed. Often they're promoted, let's say, to a management position because they've done a good job in, in the role and they're now trying to balance the day to day with the people management responsibilities. You know, the definition of a manager is essentially to manage people, but, you know, most um, managers actually just prefer to get on with their day to day. So I think there needs to be a, a massive emphasis placed on, on supporting uh, uh, management. Secondly, well-being. I think companies are doing a, a really, really good job in, in, in bringing in, you know, well-being practices, well-being days, supporting their staff. I think, um, you know, with well-being, it, it doesn't always need to be a heavy conversation. You know, I, I think just trying to, uh, we're going to talk about a sense of connection later on, but just building up those relationships because, 
um, often I think you need to build up trust. You need to build up a relationship before you know someone might say, "Listen, I'm struggling in an area A, B, and C," or there's there's this stuff going on at home. So I think as opposed to maybe rolling out an app like Headspace and hoping it sticks and hoping people use it, actually it needs to be more of a kind of human uh, human element to it. And I think with wellbeing, like like most other professional development. Um, um, capabilities, it needs that continuous follow up and support. And then not getting the desired promotion. I, like, I think this is a really tough, uh, this is a really tough job for HR managers and chief people officers. Um, because, you know, often, let's say if we pick an SME, like it's it's not, there's not a, a clear career path, often junior vice president, vice president, president, like it's not like the stage where you, you might have eight tiers or, or a professional services firm where you have a very clear structure in terms of your career plan. And um, so I, I just, just a bit of advice on this, what I would do if, if you do have a colleague that's coming to you looking for um, a, a promotion of some sort, try to get an understanding of, of um, uh, their objectives around it. Is it a status thing? Do they want to change their, their status on LinkedIn? Is it a money thing? Are they looking to earn more money because they want to put down a deposit for a mortgage or buy a new car? Um, or is it like they actually want uh, more experience? And, and what you can do, if, even if we take that uh, last one as an example, you can bring them into more meetings, you can bring, to, uh, bring them into more internal meetings or, or client uh, meetings. So just to summarize, like this is a really important issue. So, you know, we know that, you know, replacing a staff member, you know, the average cost for replacing a staff member is a third of their salary. So if you take someone on 70,000 per year, the average cost for replacing that staff member is 23,000 euro. So it's a really is an area that requires attention. Um, and we know that, let's say with, with replacing a staff member, the cost of students are higher cost or your recruitment fees, your um, your training costs for new members of staff, your advertising fees. But having spoken to lots of HR managers and chief people officers over the last you know, 18 months, it's the soft costs that are killing people. It's the job splitting that comes when someone leaves. It's the time required to both prep and conduct interviews. So, um, so just to summarize in terms of, okay, if you're looking at that retention piece and that engagement piece, really focus in on the problem. Why are people leaving and try and address those individual things within your company? Yeah, and I think two important things um, you spoke about, Philip, is that a lot of the time companies will promote our best salespeople to manager, will promote our best customer service person into a manager. And that means that one, you're going to be losing your best person in that job and maybe they're not just a good management fit, right? Not everybody yeah. should be a manager. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, sorry, Philip. No, I often think of it as a sports analogy. It's like, uh, you know, your best striker uh, being uh, a good manager for a football team or a rugby mm -hmm. team or whatever. It's not necessarily the case. They're good at what they do. They're good at scoring goals or scoring tries, but that doesn't necessarily make them a good manager. Yeah, but you still have to focus, I suppose, on that they still want development. But it could be yeah. a specialist or training exactly. or yeah. something like that. Yeah. I think it's important. Um, exactly. And then this is just a hobby also, of course, of mine. So I'm glad you mentioned it is. In terms of employee engagement, I think a lot of companies just think um, that if you buy a system, it's like tick, we've done employee engagement, we've bought an employee engagement platform. Um, uh, and as a tech person, I should be saying that's what's going to do it. However, really, that's just the facilitator. Employee engagement is yeah. still and can will always be has to be a people led thing, right? 100% agree, yeah, totally. Um, and that's, that comes from leadership, that's from their engagement with the engagement software, mm -hmm. uh, that's them um, bringing it into their weekly meetings or monthly meetings, and um, it's it's uh, popping down to someone's desk, say, hey, I haven't seen you uh, on the platform in, in a while now, or, you know, c c you know, so that, that has to be driven from from the top down. Yeah, I think so. Um, but I think so. We kind of spoke about that in terms of the um, not everybody can be a manager, not everybody should be a manager, and sometimes you promote your best people on a roles and then they just fail at being a manager. But uh, most employees still want to see that progression. So I suppose how can you kind of align what the company needs um, as well as what your employees need? Um, you know, what's kind of the best approach for HR people kind of really to focus on kind of aligning that employee need for development as well as the company needs? Yeah, it's a really good question and um, I have a, a funny story to, to kind of uh, maybe um, 
answer it in, in, in a certain way. So my first ever pitch with push me went uh, pitched into a client and uh, got to the end and they're like, yeah, that's great, Philip, but who sets the agenda? And I had no idea, like I hadn't even thought about that. Is it actually, well, is it the employee that sets the agenda with our platform or is it is it the, the um, mm -hmm. you know, the buyer, the product, typically the HR manager or CEO? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, what we've seen with our client base is that uh, certain clients like to have, you know, clear visibility of what's been worked on, uh, progression, mm -hmm. and then other clients are like, listen, you know, give Philip the autonomy. Mm -hmm. I, I trust him. He, he, he's, he's working away on the two or three things that are most important for his role. So, uh, it's a difficult one, but what I would say, just just to, um, I included this. This is our what we call professional development menu, and hopefully it, it might act as an aid for uh, for certain HR managers when when you're looking at kind of um, aligning this uh, company um, agenda is the wrong word, but the company requirements versus the the personal requirements, um, and, and we always encourage kind of two key questions. So let's say uh, ideally a direct line manager and an individual are sitting down, they have this menu in front of them, and uh, and the two key questions are, you know, what's the hardest part about your role? And then secondly, what's the one area that if you could improve would make you even more effective within your role? And what this does, it, it drives real collaboration between, you know, two individuals saying, well, you know, actually, uh, maybe your time management or uh, your prioritization piece isn't quite up to scratch. And it's to have a chat around that as opposed to saying, hey, I want to go on a management training program and I, I, I have no kind of clear objectives around that or, or clear outputs from that. So um, the other tip I'd say is, you know, measure everything, right? So even if you're using a menu like this or something else, it's like you put a rating on it. So if I'm looking at uh, just pick one, improving my communication skills during co conflict, where do I rate right now in that? Probably a three out of 10. So I'm not, not really comfortable at all. So again, I want to have this conversation with either my HR manager or a direct line manager and then go measure it. So like come back in three months and say, OK, where are you at now? You, 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 you've gone on a training program or you worked with a coach or you used a mentor. Where are you at now? Well, actually, probably a five out of 10. OK, that's really good. I, I can get measurable uh, uh, data from that. Um, and the other thing as well is, um, I was just having to think about this question and personally my view is that if an employee comes to uh, me and says, listen, I really want to do this masters or I want to do this like workshop uh, over two days, like I'd always ask, okay, what are you looking to get out of it? Like what change are you trying to bring about? Okay, because well, you ask that question, like often objective or what's your aim is it's quite difficult to answer on the spot but if you say what change are you trying to bring about well actually i do want to become a better people manager because i'm new to it so that's the change you're bringing about and then to go just a level deeper and go okay what's your specific objective okay well my sp specific objective is to learn maybe uh, three models and to start employing them into my uh, monthly check-ins so um i think I think there's definitely a collaboration piece that needs to take place and uh, whether, you know, it's um, an employee coming to you looking for uh, to do a course or to do a master's or whatever it might be, um, or whether it's the, the, the company, for example, uh, addressing a performance issue, you know, it needs to kind of have a collaborative piece as opposed to a directive one. I know, for example, my good pal works on the Ireland rugby team and he gets to go to lots of cool places and lots of cool sports teams around the world. And he was at Barcelona one time and he, he was just mentioned around any other um, analysts that go and do a training program, they're all required to come back into the boardroom, present in front of the team saying, hey, this is what other teams are doing. This is the, this is the, um, this is what's happening in the world at the moment. This is the way we, this is something we can look at going forward. So they're always bringing back the learnings into the company and that's something that I'd really encourage. Yeah, and I actually love looking at the sports analogies from that side of things. Cause I think that they're so good at naturally looking to see what other people are doing, bringing it back. They're not like, it's just something that's really just ingrained in in how they work collaborative, collaboratively as yeah. a, a team, yeah. you know, and it's something just part of it. Um, and so I suppose we, you know, the in terms of um, the, the working landscape it has changed significantly over the last three to four years with really the onset of remote and hybrid. Um, and one of the things that um, I suppose I do think that people are struggling with is that collaboration piece. So kind of if you're looking at that kind of remote and hybrid setting, um, what do you think are kind of the main obstacles or I suppose how do you still get that collaborative connection piece 
even in that remote and hybrid world, world do you think? Yeah, it's, it's probably uh, people might not be uh, too happy with this answer. It, it requires a lot of work, like any relationship, be it. No, we don't know, want that marriage. answer. But start again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be it a marriage, be it a, a colleague, be it a friend, like relationships require work. So, um, it, you know, it, it, especially in a hybrid uh, environment, there isn't that, you know, go over to the desk, have have a chat. Everything's so structured now to the minute you're, you're jumping from one call to the next there's no downtime there's so it, it does require like I, I have recommendations here about you know create those connection rituals is that a daily call and um, that where work is not mentioned it's it's hey how'd you get on in your match at the weekend or you know you said you were going for a hike how's that how many hours were you walking for just normal conversations that but but as i said that they need to be created and they need to and again, we talked about that top down level that needs to come from the top um, communication is really key as well. So like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of, you know, articles and communications around this psychological contract. So the unwritten expectations, the unwritten understandings, the unwritten obligations that exist within every company. And the, the, it's so, so important to clarify those. So just for example, it, you know, one thing is around, you know, you start your job on day one, you, you list the roles and responsibilities. That's what you went through five interviews for, you know, 18 months time, two years time, they adapt, they, they change, but often they're not addressed. You know, they might be addressed on an annual basis or, you know, an individual, but individuals are very good at keeping stuff in and getting angry and getting annoyed and saying, actually, I'm out of here instead of addressing them. So like, I think a clear communication around those, here's what's expected of you. And here's, you know, you don't need to be working past half five, six, that's not expected of you. So if you continuously, um, you know, create these clear communication channels, that definitely creates that sense of belonging within a company. And then I have uh, finally pick up the phone, like as in, um, I think people, um, I'm not uh, the first to say this, people are fatigued by Teams and Zoom and uh, Google Meet. So it's like pick up the phone at 10, 16 a.m. and ring someone and have a chat for five minutes and say, hey, just I saw an article online, I thought of you, or I just came across a mountain and I saw you on a hike, how did it go? So I think if you just bring a bit of spontaneity, everything's really structured at the moment. If you can bring some uh, sort of spontaneity in, uh, I think that would add uh, a lot of value. Yeah, and I, I, I would agree with you. I mean, obviously, we're a, we're a fully remote company, and when you're onboarding people now, it is so structured. Every day, have every part of the day has to be structured because you don't have that spontaneity in regards to just being like, hey, how's it going, Philip? This is John, who's just started. And yeah. do you want to have a coffee with him or something? Everything is so structured. So I do think um, that that spontaneity is more than doing um, Zoom cocktails at five o'clock on a Friday, because I think we're really just yeah. sick of that. <laughs> yeah. um, I never say no to that, but yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and the other bit that I think is just really important is setting the expectations and that it's got to come from from leadership down um i'll just give you an example just from my own side i'm really bad at sending emails really late at night to people um and i don't expect an answer it's just that that's how i like to work um and i've had a couple of new people who are like oh gosh i didn't realize you needed me to send emails at 10 o'clock at night and i so in regards to like one, you have to lead by example, but also the expectation. I'm like, you know, my expectation is not that you reply to me at 10 o'clock at night, you know, so so the people understand, I suppose, what's actually expected of them, I think is really important when you're working in that kind of remote environment. Couldn't agree more. I think uh, there, there's, a, there's um, a term called professional contracting, mm -hmm. and this is the this is the concept that, uh, so let's say on our monthly check-in, um, it talks about your ways of working. It's it's not actually talking about um, tasks we're working on or your KPIs or your performance measures. And that's a perfect example. You know, you might say to me, hey, Philip, um, just, you know, yeah. the way uh, my agenda is at the moment, I have to knock off 4 p.m. from 7 p.m. And actually, I might just um, check, you know, I might log in for an hour and I, I totally don't expect you to reply to me just to set that straight from the start. And there's probably going to be four or five of those things in terms of how you work and what you expect. Um, and everything from like, Personally, 
I don't like being CC'd in emails if I don't need to be. Um, just it's busy, it's noise for me. So again, if you can communicate that early doors, you know, it's little things like that that actually make a big uh, make a big difference. Even yeah, and I definitely think that um, we are all a bit Zoom and Teams fatigued, um, and it's kind of just sometimes we're just going through the motions. So to do that, bringing that spontaneity and just being ringing up saying, you know what, I'm just ringing to see. Do you want to have a coffee for three minutes <laughs> yeah. while we're online? You know, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I actually have two questions here that we're just going to fly to. Um, Philip, nothing too hard, I promise. But um, so... Uh, I go on news. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you still there? No. Um, is it up to managers to bring up development or wait until employees show interest? In your opinion? I would say it's up to managers um, because everyone's busy, everyone's just doing the job and getting it done. And actually people, again, you look back at the problem, right? You look back at the problem of why people become disengaged. So you have to be proactive in this space. So if people become disengaged because of job and career reasons, you have to be proactive. You can't wait for them to say, hey, I'm not actually happy with my career progression in here. That's the reason, you know, I decided to join another company. So I would say it's up to management, it's up to leadership um, and, you know, we talk about structure and things like that. You know, it needs to be done on a structured basis, which is your monthly check-in or your quarterly review or your annual appraisal, whatever it is. But it's also, again, bringing it into your everyday conversation. So just uh, uh, a quick uh, backstory again on this. So I remember in the last company I worked for, um, you know, I wasn't hitting my performance target. And our CEO at the time, really great guy, great pals with him. He kept saying, listen, you can buy your boat or you can buy a tower if you hit it. And, you know, he, he was very much like, listen, you can earn more money. But like that wasn't the driver for me. I always wanted to uh, set up my own company. So once he kind of realized that and, and he only got that from me from having the conversations, you know, out for lunch or having a beer or whatever. And he realized that actually I wanted to set up my own company eventually. Um, so once you started poking that kind of bear saying, hey, listen, if you want to start your own company, you want to grow and you want to be able to sell, then, you know, you have to be able to do it here because when you go out on your own, you're not, you're not, um, you know, you know, it's just not going to work. So, so that's like, it's, and that only came from conversations. Like I often uh, use this example, what motivates you? Like you go onto any website and say, hey, you hate to find out what, you know, Get your staff up for it. It's like use questions like what motivates you. I, I know when I've been asked that question, I'm like, oh, I don't I don't really know how to answer that. Like as in I can't really think. Um, but actually if you if you can try and um and again come back to relationships and that be uh, and it and putting the hard work in, that often comes out through conversations. And, and they don't need to be structured. You don't need to have a script. It's just like they'll naturally come up if you put the work in. Yeah, and I, I would really agree with you for our side of things. We have a a huge emphasis on motivational fit when we're interviewing somebody and it doesn't have to be you know some ridiculous question really what we just ask is where was the favorite what was your favorite job what did you like about it and if they yeah. they answer well you know what um i love to work with people i really loved being french house whatever it is and they've applied for a job when they're never ever going to speak to a person yeah um, that's interesting or you know if they say and then i always love to ask well what job did you hate you know and if they're like, oh, well, you know what? I hate working with people. <laughs> and you're like, well, this job is all about working with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the motivation is, is is really key, or even just motivation down to, you know, I'm just really focused because I need my motivation at the moment is I need to buy, I need to get a mortgage, or yeah. I, I want to move because my girlfriend is moving down to Claire and that's why I'm moving there. Yeah. You know, so I think that connection and that motivation is really important. Um, yeah, I love those questions. They're great. Yeah, and, and I would agree with you. I think it's, it's you know in in the ideal world employees are coming to you telling you all the development that they that they need and pushing things on and that you've got this wonderful open transparent um a workplace where people are really driving their careers that's the optimum and that's what we want to do here in hr locker sometimes employees do need to have that kind of kind of push or just that understanding that that opportunity is there um and to facilitate that from a leadership perspective yeah. One more question, you're not just off yet, is um, could you provide some examples of how HR teams have successfully managed resistance to organisational change and turned sceptics into advocates? That's a mouthful. Sorry, yeah. I can, I, just, I can rephrase, I can read it again. <laughs> Here we go. 
Can you provide examples of how HR teams have successfully managed resistance to organizational change, put in a change, and turned skeptics into advocates? Yeah, um, I'm trying to kind of think of specific examples. Um, what I would say is that uh, there's some skeptics and some uh, resistors that will always be skeptics and resistors. That's their uh, that's their profile. That's what they're best at. So I wouldn't um, I wouldn't give them too much energy. You can try a couple of times, but then you know it's it's diminishing returns after that. Um, yeah, personally, I, 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 you know, just because we're a young enough company, so we, we haven't seen it ourselves within the company. But I think um, what it requires, like, um, obviously I'm saying, is it requires a bit of coaching as well, because it, it does, you need to get below the surface. Like, so what are their barriers to, like, what, what are their barriers to change? Mm -hmm. um, there's a great story again, I'm telling lots of stories today, but, um, you know, there, there was, um, uh, there was these two famous researchers in the States and uh, they basically uh, did a study on heart patients. So they sat outside a, a, a doctor's room and they interviewed patients uh, who came out and were prescribed one pill a day for the rest of their lives. And they asked these patients, you know, um, you know, how likely if you come back in 12 months time, are you likely to be taking this pill? And they're kind of looking at them like they have two heads and they say, are you kidding me? Like, as in, I might have a stroke and die if I don't take this bill. It's it's free on my insurance, yeah. you know, and there's no side effects, you know. I'm taking it. Like, of course, <laughs> I, yeah, of course, I'm going to be taking this. But anyway, uh, they come back 12 months later, and I think it's it's around 37 percent of uh, those patients are are still taking the pill. Wow. So a huge amount dropped off. So, and, and actually, and when they were asking them. Um, you know why? You know why? You know, imagine this. Imagine you're 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 taking the pill every day, and um, and you know, you're it's on your table, and you've got your your list of seven days and stuff like that. And they kept they kept kind of poking and poking and probing them, and they're like, you know, I could I could I could die if I stopped taking these pills. So they weren't actually asking answering the question. Mm -hmm. But when they got to the surface, and actually they realised that these people thought that if they were taking the pill every day that it would they would be a sick person they'd be an old sick person so like it does require a bit of work around the question around change the psyche yeah exactly so and, and that's a skillful art in itself um, and i know it's probably not the, not the best answer no, but no, i think you're right it, though it, yeah i like i i always find when you're looking at change management sometimes your change champions you presume are going to be your managers but actually your change champions are people in your company who people listen to they, yeah, could, they may yeah, have been yeah. their longest. They're just the most opinionated. Get yeah. them to be your change champions. And years ago, I was at an event um, with a very prominent CEO of a company, and somebody actually asked some very similar question to this, and was a room full of HR managers, and he said, "I just fired them all." And we were all like, oh, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> That's one way we were like, "I feel like that is not the correct <laughs> approach." Um, and he was like, "No, if they are not on board, we just fire them." We were like, "Okay." Um, so I wouldn't go that drastic. Yeah, far, maybe. But, but I would Quite also, um, I would also agree with you though that some people are just going to complain, and you know that yes, you need to be able to do some coaching with them and move them along. And hopefully there is that kind of herd mentality that if 80% of the staff are moving along with the change, those 20% yeah. of resistors are just going to yeah. eventually move along as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Is, is probably, I don't know, you know, don't fire them all. I, I didn't say that. But <laughs> 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 um, um, and I, we're just going to ask one more question we're going to move then on is, um, yeah. how much time should managers spend on building a sense of connection with their team? I don't know, can you measure that? Yeah, I, again, it's a hard one to answer in terms of like two days a week or two hours a day or whatever it may be. But it it's, you know, some you'll get us like we're the most complex species. Like humans are just like some people like to be left alone. Some people uh, actually need that. You talk to people that like working with people or don't like working with people. So it's definitely you got to you got to read the room a bit with each individual. Um, and the other thing is like. It's, it's trying to be honest with them as well. And it's just saying, listen, you know, I'm really keen to get a really tight team together. You know, I'm planning to check in with you or have a call or whatever. So if you just, you know, again, coming back to this ways of working, 
you know, does that sit okay with you or, you know, do you prefer just a, a weekly check in or whatever it may be? So you can ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to, you know, have these conversations with people. It's not, there's no right or wrong because as I say, humans are so complex. Yeah. Each individual is different. Yeah. And I would even say in our own company is that I would advocate that you're doing weekly check ins with people. However, um, with a lot of the people that, that work with me, I'm only doing a monthly catch up or every two weeks because they don't want to speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> and they're happy, <laughs> you know, and they're yeah. like, I don't need to be talking to you once a week about my feelings, you know, so, and that's okay. <laughs> and yeah, then others yeah, yeah. do, and that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, I think I, think I may have said it earlier, like conversations don't always need to talk about feelings yeah. and uh, they can just be garbage talk as well. Like it's just, as I say, it's like trying to build that, build that relationship up and in turn, then trust comes with that. Yeah, I totally agree. And it is just that trust element of that. I suppose for me, ultimately, what I want to know about my team is if they're having a problem that they're coming yeah. and telling me and we can yeah. we can deal with that. And it's not a work problem. It's like, you yeah. know what? I can't start till 10 past nine because I got to drop the kids at school. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, no problem. We can solve that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's, that's the main thing. Brilliant, yeah. Um, so I suppose, you know, I'm really kind of a... Um, I suppose I like to focus on in terms of leadership and what that actually means for people. And I do think a lot of companies, like we spoke earlier, um, move people into management and leadership roles and they give them the handbook and they're like, now you're a manager, off you go. And um, a lot of companies, I think, don't understand the power a manager can have on employees and also the importance of actual leadership. It's not actually just managing people's day to day. It's making yeah. sure people are comfortable, making sure people um that you you know are coming to you with issues and it has to be from a leadership um approach um so i suppose if we look at that in terms of leadership strategies um what do you think are kind of the the most effective strategies that you look at in terms of that you put in place for companies to really kind of foster that collaborative approach that team dynamic approach um and not just from a remote perspective but really just from an a, an inclusive team team building perspective. Yeah, um, so we, we kind of looked at where we're looking at six pillars here, and it's it's not to say go off and uh, start doing all these. We're start doing doing it. Check in, start, in by start the end getting, of the day, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> start getting that purpose. Yeah. Start like, but and, and I'm sure lots of companies are doing um, you know five out of six uh, these six things really well, or four out of six. So it's about actually well recognition isn't great, and uh, we were really good at the start of the year or at our quarterly um, um, meetup. A company meetup, but actually, aside from that, I can't see much emails going out or you know managers. So the key thing, and again, we're very much data driven and bushy. So it's like look at the problem. Okay, well, even if you look at check in, so fifty percent of employees who quit say that no one in the company checked in with them, you know, prior to three months of leaving. I get that's amazing. That's an amazing stat. Um, and but it's amazing that because companies are still you know maybe on this annual appraisal. So like again. For 11 months and you know 29 days of the year, they're just focused in on operational tasks. Hey, where are we at with that project? Where are we at with that client? Uh, that client problem. So, like, we're all about obsessing about employee problems, not client problems. Like, companies are obsessed with you know client problems, and I think that needs to kind of move down into employee problems. Uh, feedback is critical as well. Like, again, we talk about uh, managers, uh, inexperienced managers in particular. They just don't like giving feedback, they, especially if it's in any way tinged in a, in a negative way. Um, so that that's really important, but something that that's not happening in, in a lot of companies. Talk about purpose as well. Again, I was thinking about purpose and I think again, this all like my instinct when I talk about purpose, I'm thinking, oh, like that windmill company is building something and it's saving up the planet or, um, you know, there's there's a really cool company who's recycling food. Like that's such a great purpose, but like not every company has that. So again, the last company I worked for was in mobile communications. So it's very hard to sell. Hey, we're trying to change the world and in, in, you know, around messaging and how we secure messaging and things like that. But what they did do, they brought it, we, they brought it back home. They said, listen, we want to hit this target this year because we want to look after everyone in here. We talked about, you know, putting a deposit down for a mortgage or buying a car or sending their kids to school. That's a purpose. So we're trying to go for this target because we're trying to look after Philip and Emma and, and whoever else. 
So it doesn't always necessarily need to be this like amazing thing that's going to save the planet or, or, or change, you know, how we consume food or anything like that. And the other key thing around purpose is continuously trying to tie an individual's role to the company's purpose. So that's anything from, you know, going to someone in the account and say, hey, brilliant, um, you know, uh, our debtors are still at 30 days and that's actually helped pay the wages and pay bonuses uh, this quarter. Brilliant job, well done, thanks very much. So that, that ties it to the purpose. Or again, the sales person hits their sales number. Again, that feeds into that kind of company of we're all looking after each other and that's really helped. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other things like autonomy, um, again, really important. No one likes being micromanaged. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd really, really recommend how, you know, how can you do it better? How can you do it faster? And, um, you know, just ask simple questions around this where they can actually have a bit of autonomy around what they're doing and then just deliver it in a better way. And then finally, like this is data from our own um, from our own user base. So at the start of, of work with our users and um, we asked them, you know, do you understand what's clearly expected of you within your role? So four and ten employees don't, and that's 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 actually low. It's it's more like five or six and ten employees don't clearly understand what's expected of them. So again, it comes back to my earlier point of like continuously review that with employees. On day one, they have these list of roles and responsibilities. Is that the same in 18 months time? Are you continuously updating that? Are you reviewing it? Are you chatting about it to see that they're happy? Do they need to delegate more, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more that in terms of that expectation and that continuous feedback loop, managers don't like to give negative feedback. It doesn't have to be negative. It's really yeah. how are we going to, and again, I hate to use another sports analogy, but you know, at the, at the end of every match, it's not like everybody comes in and goes, you're all crap. It was like, so yeah. these are the bits that need to be improved for ne the yeah. next match. You know, and I think that that is a skill that managers need to be taught in regards to that's what the feedback is. It's not saying, well, you know what, Philip, you were supposed to do 10 of these, you only did eight. That was about yeah. 10. You were supposed to do yeah. six of these and you did four. Okay, see you next month. You know, so, so it is that, that and, and how it fits into the company, right? My job may be really, I think it's real small, but what, where's, where, where's my cog in the company? How do I yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is important. And having those conversations, you understand the individual more, you understand the role more because, you know, they're, they're, they're on the front line often and, unless you're living and breathing that role, you, you don't clearly understand it. So having those types of feedback conversation actually triggers a really good conversation and um, where you can then make positive changes after that. Yeah, I do agree. And I'm, I'm just a, a massive advocate in regards to check-ins and feedback in that we have got to move away from this. We we annually appraise everybody. We don't speak to anybody then for 11 months of the year. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. and to look at something, oh, well, you know, you, you did this in February. Let's talk about it now in December. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I digress. So, um, so I suppose, um, Philip, in terms of um, my um, original background, I suppose is is in HR, but my job now is more in an operations side of things. So I'm all facts and figures, um, and I do think that HR has got to move into that metric space, facts and figures. Um, and I always say to people, if you want to be at the top table or the boardroom table. HR can't be the only people who are get going without facts and figures. Everybody else does, and you have to. You can still that doesn't kill the people element, but you've got to measure the things that you're doing. Um, so, for I suppose from your experience, what are kind of some of the key measurable results that 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 people can put in place from a HR perspective? Yeah, so these are kind of the eight, uh, eight areas that we measure uh, with each of our users, so engagement level. So essentially you can do a 50 question engagement survey or you can do a six and, and you'll, you'll probably come to similar enough results. So we measure the engagement score pre-working with us and, and uh, post-working with us. Um, so we won't go through, you know, individual um, uh, increases, uh, but just coming back to my earlier point, it is really important to measure. So coming back to that example of, you know, someone, you know, if, you, if you're if you're investing in any kind of development program for your employees, like what does success look like? You know, what's my ROI? Is it quantitative? Is it qualitative? If it's, you know, qualitative, you know, I think it's really important, again, to manage up. It's like, okay, so a HR manager, chief people officer, you know, their role is like, to develop people, okay? So how do they demonstrate that to the leadership team? So I collate testimonials, for example, from your colleagues say, hey, how'd you find course? It was absolutely amazing, blah, blah, blah. I literally capture that. 
feed it in a, a monthly report or you know deliver it in an email to the leadership team say hey this is a really good course so you're basically you're sharing with you know the leadership team that this was i made an investment in people here's the feedback we're getting and here's the results we're getting so i think that's really really important um but you know often when it comes to things like soft skills it is it is hard to measure so maybe it's the more kind of qualitative thing um, and i don't think necessarily you need to go into the level of detail detail like 360 feedback reviews or anything like that i think they're you know that they're they're useful but they can often be damaging as well um, so yeah, as in the, these are some of the results we're getting, but I think the key message I'm, I'm trying to um, um, portray is that, you know, it is no matter what you do in terms of investing in people, it is really important to measure outcomes because um, it just, it helps the individual themselves. So again, when we, when we issue a quarterly report to an individual, they can see, okay, amazing, I'm actually improving, I'm working on this specific area and I can see improvement. So that gives a lot of confidence as well. Like amazingly, I think the, the, the number two topic of, so we've done analysis over the last 500 sessions there recently, the number two topic is around self-belief. So like, so a lot of a lot of individuals go on management training programs or leadership development training programs, and they're a really good start, but they don't cater for those you know unique needs, the unique motivations, the unique challenges, the unique ambitions that each individual uh, has. Um, and, and for example, like a lot of people have all the theory around management, but don't necessarily have the confidence to to execute it. So, so that's why you know we believe our product is 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 very worthwhile because it. You know, it helps people, give them that dedicated space to go. Actually, I'm not comfortable giving feedback, or um, you know, I, I I don't know how to handle this situation with a direct report. Um, so yeah, as I said, I don't I don't want to harp on too much about this. No, I think it's important because even when you start with, well, what's the actual purpose? You know, what do we want to get out of this? And yeah, you know, I can't tell you how many companies I've spoken to who are like, well, we put in this employee engagement thing and. When we see somebody's not engaged, we send out a survey and we have 100% completion rate on the survey, so they're back engaged again. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're not engaged now. They just completed the survey. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so, so make sure your measurements are actually that there is an ROI on it, that it's not just completion rates, because I, I I hate that when even in regards to your annual, your reviews or your appraisals or whatever way you're doing it, Completion rates are important to understand that they're being done, but what, yeah. what's the actual outcome? Is the most yeah, exactly. Part. And what are you going to do about it? So yeah. based on the ones you get back. So again, the four and ten, mm -hmm. you know, don't clearly understand what's expected of them. So the the, the tough tough job for HR managers um, is you know when when they get the results from these surveys, there's a list of twenty things to do. So it's about you know prioritizing those, um, along with doing company policies and contracts and everything like that. So um yeah so that is a challenge but yeah. you know it is no, I, I totally agree important. in terms of looking at that objective piece yeah and, so, and 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 things can be measured you just need to figure out a way to measure them and and yes completion rates for me is it's important because you're getting the feedback it's um a lot of the time i think when you look at that completion rate if something isn't being done well it's do you really want to chase people just to mandatory fill it out or do you actually want to I know, I know, yeah, yeah do you want to figure out well, why weren't they doing it in the first place you know yeah. Um, yeah yeah and i also think something that and i don't know do you have any kind of feedback of this or statistics on this but in terms of um most appraisals i'm assuming most people are going to say that after their appraisal nothing happens you know that they've got a they may have a feedback or whatever and then nobody talks about it for another 11 months so what was the purpose <laughs> to begin with? yeah you know, which I think is important. and the, the key thing with this i think as well is is for i suppose managers and leaders don't fully understand um and what it means to someone so whether it's a title change or whether it's 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 a, a bump in salary or it's you know i'm keen to move into sales or finance or whatever it is like that means the world to someone but actually and when someone doesn't follow up on let's say okay yeah listen I, let, let's get a call booked in in two weeks time we'll, we'll get moving on that and that doesn't happen that's a big blow for an individual mm -hmm. so like like you say it's so important that you know you actually commit to, to what you're saying in either your appraisal or monthly check-in because it, as i say 
you know, it means a lot more to the individual you're working with than it does to you. For you, or for, you know, often managers think, oh, here's another thing I have to mm -hmm. do, but actually it's really important to your colleagues. So, yeah, and it was, uh, and it was a huge thing. Piece. Yeah, it was probably a huge thing for them to ask it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so not to, yeah, I'd agree with you. Um, so um, I'm just gonna finish up the questions here. Um, so uh, Philip, when you're measuring re results, should you share these with employees or should they um, be private between the manager and the company? Um, so it'd be good to get a bit of clarity around that. So um, is it is it for an individual or is it for is it company wide? Yeah, so I suppose, I mean, in regards to for an individual, I presume we're sharing results to an individual. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then company wide. Um, look, I'm very open yeah, and transparent. Think, but as, long, <laughs> as long as it's anonymized, I yeah. think is the key yeah exactly yeah. i presume we're not we're not publishing philip doesn't like jane and <laughs> jane <laughs> is upset with emma no no that's you have world war three now i wouldn't recommend <laughs> exactly um so philip thank you so much um for taking the time to to talk to us i really do appreciate it um we've gone our, through our, over our time um if people want to get in contact with you philip what's the best way to to do that obviously i have your details here but on linkedin or three email yeah connect to me on linkedin love to uh, love to connect and my email is there as i say so just drop me a line if you have any questions happy to help and share any resources we have as well brilliant thank you so much for taking the time i could speak to you for another half an hour so um so do appreciate it um as always, so Jenny will uh, wrap all of this up and send out recordings um, to anybody who was here today. And um, always lovely to have, have everybody here. So thank you so much and we will talk to you all soon.